Good morning, everybody, and uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and welcome you to the second of uh, the Southeast Chapters trip uh, Coffee Conversations. And um, this month, I, I'll turn it over to David Sparks uh, with Kimley Horn. Um, David uh, lives in Alpharetta, Georgia, and is a associate and senior project manager for Kimley Horn and Associates with 23 years of engineering experience and 19 years focused on aviation. Um, he's led runway, taxiway, apron, landside cargo and de-icing projects across the South and has also served in engineering and quality control roles for airports across the country. Um, in his current role, David leads an aviation team performing planning and design of landside and airside improvements at airports. Uh, recently, glycol, de-icing and cargo projects have become an additional focus at, uh, in his practice. David is a graduate from University of Tennessee, so hence the uh, College World Series banter, I think a little oh, bit. Oh, <laughs> And uh, graduated in 1998 and began his engineering career in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, with his first aviation project being the design of one of the earliest Group, four, group 6 taxiways, taxiway uh, Y at uh, Memphis International. So um, just as, as people join on, just keep a reminder, it looks like everyone's doing a good job, but staying on mute. Um, and if you want to use the speaker view at the top right um, under that little view button, that might help uh, highlight the speakers as, as we go through this. Um, use the chat window to ask questions of David. Um, you know, it's intended that this is about a 25, 30 minute presentation with 10 to 15 minutes Q&A at the end, and we will uh, try to end right on 10.45 or so. Um, so with that, um, I, David, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Yeah, I don't see a chat window open up on mine, so maybe if someone starts using it, it'll open up. But, um, but I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate everybody joining us. Um, so uh, this is probably going to be a little bit of uh, just an open discussion between the two, the two panelists. I think they're going to uh, there's an airport perspective and developer perspective, but I imagine they'll both uh, input on, on each other's uh, areas there. They're, they're fairly well uh, overlapped. So, uh, so uh, Kevin, uh, Steve, please, uh, please feel free to, to jump in with your thoughts as well. Appreciate y'all's uh, participation. Um, so, yeah, today we have, uh, we have Kevin Howe, who's Senior VP, uh, sorry, uh, Chief Operating Officer at the Greenville Spartanburg Airport District. And I am not sure why this is doing this. I apologize. Must have it on some kind of a, a loop or something. Um, I am not sure. And then uh, Steve Four with uh, Executive VP and uh, Chief. Uh, sorry about that. Chief Investment Officer at Aviation Facilities Company. Um, so uh, we'll see if this doesn't work. I will. I will try to figure out something else here. Um, uh, if it keeps moving like that. Um, kind of wanted to start out just a little bit before we get into our discussion a little bit with kind of like a, a graph here. Uh, you know, thank you to Steve and, and, uh, AFCO for providing this, uh, sourced information, um, that they, uh, that they provided. Um, as you can see here, you can see the domestic international worldwide growth year over year of, of cargo volumes. Um, you know, as we've seen since 2020 and 2021. So as everyone has expected through the pandemic, you know, cargo has, has grown dramatically, I think, you know, you're looking at since uh, this April, the last April, you're looking at between, you know, 22 and 25 percent probably growth between domestic and, and international and uh, about 11 or 12 percent worldwide. So obviously cargo is growing. Um, I know at, at, uh, for both of our uh, panelists today, um, cargo has been a big part of their individual pursuits at GSP and uh, for Kevin and, and with Steve, uh, um, Steve developing facilities across the country. So. Uh, just kind of wanted to, to give a brief uh, cargo volume where we're where we're looking at year over year. So thank you again, Steve, for that information. Um, so we'll kind of get get going to this, and then you know I, I know we'll we'll stop for about 15 minutes worth of uh, Q and A, John, um, at the end. Uh, so I'll definitely uh, definitely keep that keep that there uh, in mind. So uh, I guess we'll go ahead and start a little bit um, with the airport perspective, uh, um, Kevin. Um, you know, we talked a little bit um, in some of the initial talks that Steve and Kevin and I had about um, where you see growth over the next three to five years for um, airports, uh, specifically airports like yourself uh, with some of the, I think you've done some interesting um, 
think some interesting approaches to how you operate the cargo at your airport, I think that might be interested as well. So I was wondering if you could kind of give a little bit of a, how you see cargo growth over the next three to five years um, going just, to, you know, in the business and especially at airports uh, such as GSP. Yeah, just to, and I'll just touch base real quick. I mean, GSP is a little different than, um, let's say, a lot of the other airports. I mean, and there's there's three main categories of air cargo. Obviously, you got your integrators like FedEx and UPS, and you put pipeline Amazon in that category as an integrator as well. You got your belly cargo. Uh, everybody knows that's you know flying in the bellies of the passenger airliners. But uh, uh, GSP really specializes uh, in the you know the freighter market, the all cargo aircraft. Um, and, uh, and that's, and that from our perspective at, at GSP, uh, you know, I'll, a little bit of background too. the airport here at GSP, we are also a ground handler and a warehouse operator. Uh, most airports do not do that. Um, um, you know, we've got this, uh, uh we have an automotive uh, manufacturer here right next door to us. Some of you may be familiar with BMW, uh, when we hosted SEC conference a few years ago, we got the BMW factory, uh, right at our back door. Uh, they're producing over 400,000 cars a year, and they, they still set a record even in 2020 during COVID uh, and pushed out almost 450,000 units. Um, so we, we specialize in a lot of automotive uh, parts and finished cars, but we, we do a lot of other stuff as well. But uh, um, a long time ago, BMW wanted to start flying their cargo into GSP, and we didn't have a ground handler uh, to work the freighters. Um, so and we, when we talked to ground handlers they wouldn't come here because we didn't have any scheduled flights so we were it's kind of a chicken and the egg kind of situation so the airport stood up a ground handling business uh we, it's branded uh, we, we call it cerulean aviation but it is part of the gsp airport district um and we started small uh several years ago with you know one or two flights a week over to germany 747 400s um today um this week alone we had uh uh 10 74 uh, 747s going over to Germany. We had a couple of A340s and we're getting crater activity on top of that. Uh, um, so we're calendar year, we're up almost 125% uh, on a calendar year basis. On a moving 12 month basis, we we're probably up about 75% in freight. Um, now, I think Michael Cloud might have already asked the question is this you know, sustainable or is this really COVID? Um, I will tell you, not all of it will stick. Uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of stuff moving by passenger aircraft. We're service, you know, the, the term now is freighters, uh, just freighters with a P. Uh, they're taking passenger aircraft and loading them uh, with cargo. Um, and we're seeing a lot of the European carriers doing that into GSP. Um, I don't, obviously that doesn't stick. I think that, that traffic goes back to the bellies when the bellies uh, capacity is available. But uh, our freighter business is way up. Um, a lot of that's due to the disruptions in ocean freight and all the supply chains uh, uh, being damaged. Uh, but, you know, historically, uh, you know, probably 95% of the world's trade by, by weight moved by ocean. Um, and the balance was by, uh, mainly by air. Um, but all it takes is a 1% shift uh, from ocean to air and it equals about a 16% growth for air cargo. And there's a lot of uh, uh, folks in the logistics business that are anticipating a, a two to 3% shift uh, from ocean to air, um, even after COVID. So I think people have gotten used to uh, Amazon effect of wanting their stuff within two days. Um, and with all the supply chain disruptions, uh, there's a lot of companies moving to air um, especially in the retail electronics, throw, throw healthcare in there as well. But we're, we're I, I think some of this actually sticks. Um, um, maybe not all of it, but uh, a good percentage it does. Kevin, you were saying some good growth before the pandemic as well, year we over year growth, correct? Okay. Yeah, I mean, and you got to think we we we're, I still say we're a startup in this business. Um, um, you've got your legacy gateways uh, on, in the freighter worlds, like you know Atlanta, JFK, Miami, Chicago. Um, there's a, there's a few of these, what we call alternate uh, airport cargo gateways. Uh, I'll, I'll put GSP in that mix, but he, he, before GSP entered that business, there was Huntsville, uh, Rickenbacker outside of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so Rockford in there is, a, is an alternate to, to Chicago. Um, I think what we're seeing is freight forwarders and shippers are starting to, they're finally coming around and seeing the value of 
uh, of the smaller, less less congested alternate mm -hmm. uh, cargo gateways, uh, for, especially on the freighter all cargo business. Okay, cool. Um, it's kind of kind of following up with 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 what you said there is uh, what you know you you talked a little bit about the um, the advantages you believe that GSP offers. Um, you know, handling the cargo, maintaining staffing, um, and and you discussed your process versus you know operating um, operating yourself versus contracting it. Basically, do you have anything else to add on that, or or do do you the FBO does the FBO play a role in your in knowing your market and how you how you operate that or it's 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 kind of it's kind of GSP is kind of a little bit different. Uh, we were actually doing the cargo and ground handling business before we. We actually run the FBO now as well as GSP okay. and all the fueling operations. But uh, we were actually in the cargo and ground handling before we were in the FBO business. So okay. the FBO is actually just kind of a maturing of, of our of our ground handling business. Um, and then you know ultimately we you know, now we have the FBO, the commercial fuel. Uh, we do air cargo ground handling as well as passenger ground handling as well as warehouse services. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's. Originally, I'll say there was some conversation within the airport of, you know, are we doing this, you know, on a temporary basis to kind of incubate it, get it going and turn it over. Um, I'll be honest with you, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a significant profit. Uh, I'll say it's a business line for the airport district now, uh, and it's making um, good revenue, good, good profitability. I I'm not sure we're willing at this point to give it up easily. So, yeah. um, you know, if we brought in a, a private ground handler, we might be lucky to make you know three to five percent of uh of gross on it and um, um it's, it's got good margins for us cool um i guess we can kind of kind of go next to uh you know what uh what are some of the pressure points and and i imagine both you and steve can, can jump in on this one i think one that we talked about um initially uh last week when we were going over some items is um you know, salaries for the, for the, and, and getting the workers, uh, enough workers hired to handle the cargo. Um, can, can each of y'all speak on that? I, I know you can speak from the GSP and I think Steve, you had some, some ideas from the domestic versus international with how salaries are handled and, and how we're going to have to kind of maybe adjust that uh, in the future. So staffing is definitely a challenge, especially, uh, it was, it was a challenge before COVID. It was a big, mm -hmm. it's even a bigger challenge now, obviously, um, getting people, um, that want to work in that industry um, at that pay range, uh, and and the pay range is really driven by our uh, our customers because they 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 don't want to pay a ton <laughs> uh, for ground handling. So uh, you know, just like you see in the airlines, the airlines try to tend to drive down those uh, ground handling wages be based on what they're willing to pay. But uh, staffing is definitely a um, a challenge for us. I think we we we've, we've had to adjust pay ranges this past year uh, in that category, but. Uh, uh, staffing is always going to be a challenge um, in, in the air cargo industry, I believe. Um, and St Steve probably sees it on a bigger scale than I do. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I just, um, to Dave's point, there, there's a bright distinction between um, how air cargo, ground handling, and services that in the United States seem generally to be priced and viewed as manual labor jobs or semi-skilled jobs in, in Europe and, and in Asia, um, they're viewed as uh, key professional positions in the overall supply chain. Um, rates are higher um, for shipping, generally speaking, but the quality is higher, the longevity of workforce is higher. And one of the things we end up um, discussing with folks that are doing business in the United States and well in Europe fairly frequently is when is the United States going to really start valuing this element of the business sector in aviation versus it just constantly being a race to the bottom in terms of price per ton, price per kilo. And that's not to say it always is a race to the bottom, but many times it is. That's reflected in wage rates and that's reflected in difficulty in attracting and retaining talent. Okay. Thanks. Uh, is there, you know, now with, with so much cargo becoming more international, I mean, how, how is the uh, uh, Customs Border Protection handled, Kevin, um, on, at the airport? And uh, I mean, Steve, you probably see that as well from some of your facilities as well. So I think both of y'all could kind of address CBP from y'all's from perspectives. 
Yeah, uh, just talking about the pressure point. CVP is uh, definitely a pressure point uh, in our in our market. Uh, you know, the port the the port uh, director um, for CVP in our area. I think they have five officers at GSP. Um, based on our growth and where we're seeing that business go, that's not enough. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when CVP gets additional funding and additional resources, they're not really being deployed to the airports. Uh, I think other airports are seeing that on the passenger processing side, but we're we're definitely seeing on the cargo side that they're short staffed um, because those uh, the port staff is not only responsible for air cargo and GA clearances uh, at the international facility and occasionally you'll have some international passenger charters, um, but they're also handling FTZs and regulatory issues in our area and it's just not enough uh, uh, CBP staffing. Um, and luckily for GSP, we, we signed up for the reimbursable services program um, probably about four or five years ago. Um, and we've had to leverage that um, uh, to, to, to get CBP uh, covered after hours for, uh, for cargo activity. Um, uh, Steve, do you have, do you have uh, any? Uh, I, I would agree there? with everything Kevin said. It's a problem, you know, in secondary airports that where staffing is spread thin and at gateway airports where even with dedicated staff to a particular airport, the volumes exceed the capabilities of the staffing in many instances in terms of quick turns. Um, it, the only thing I would say that um, maybe is uh, a glimmer of hope on, on both fronts is continued advancements and, and adoption of technologies, cargo community systems, integration with customs clearance um, and, and all those other uh, safety and, and kind of tax oriented items um, I, I think it's very defensible from kind of an analytical perspective to suggest technology could um, allow uh, the few people we have to do a whole lot more. Um, mm -hmm. The, the question is going to be the, the time it takes for full integration and adoption of the technology that's there. Um, but my guess is the solution is based in uh, in that, in, in technology and, and not hiring more people. Um, okay. It would be nice if, if both could happen, but uh, I think technology is probably the key. Okay. Uh, Kevin, I don't know if you saw, uh, John asked, uh, you know, uh, yeah, are you aware of other airports? I think you mentioned a couple. Um, uh, well, uh, the, that that, that self-performed ground handling. Yeah. Uh, there, there's not many. Uh, the one that I know that's uh, similar to us is Rickenbacker, uh, the Columbus uh, Airport Authority outside of uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, runs Rickenbacker, which is a uh, cargo dedicated airport. Uh, we, we, we've always said we've kind of patterned ourselves a little bit after Rickenbacker. We're a few years behind them, um, but they, they do the what you know, we call below the wing uh, services for uh, uh, freighters at Rickenbacker. They do not do warehousing today. So we, that's something we do do. Um, um, Allentown, uh, I, I believe it's Allentown. They, they were, they took a dive into some ground handling initially in the e-commerce area, but I think they've, they've gotten out of it. They, they wised up pretty quickly and, uh, maybe we weren't as smart as they were, but, uh, sometimes, sometimes I've had airports ask us, uh, how to get into what we're doing. And, um, we kind of joke and say, first, you want to make sure you get a, get your head examined. Um, <laughs> But it's, uh, it's, it's definitely challenging, um, but it, it can be rewarding. Uh, you know, GSB has, a, I'll say, a very entrepreneurial kind of uh, spirit and uh, mission uh, with our board of directors and kind of our history here at the airport. And so we, we take some risks, uh, but I, I think there's, uh, you know, the, the risk and reward equation. Uh, and, and so far, this has proven to be, uh, you know, it's been a positive for GSB. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, approaches you're taking to, you know, address the need for growing cargo, uh, um, I, I know you've, I know you got a couple of projects going, trying to expand some aprons. You've recently done, um, you continue continue along that process, just planning for future growth. Yeah, the, so we we just built uh, in, in September 2019. We opened up a hundred, little over 100,000 square feet of new cargo facilities. Uh, we're using half of it uh, for our ground handling operation, and we have a freight forwarder on the other half. Uh, we are we are out of space already, and um, actually looking at contracts this morning. We'll probably in the next uh, few weeks be pulling the trigger to add another fifty thousand square feet to that facility. Uh, that was really phase one of our new center cargo uh, apron. We have plans for a phase two, um, 
phase one had about 17 acres of apron. Uh, we've got three wide body uh, cargo positions there as well as the building. Uh, phase two gives us another three uh, wide body parking positions uh, as well as another 150 to 200,000 square feet of uh, cargo capacity. Mm -hmm. um, the, ch the challenge is funding always. Um, um, we were lucky to get, uh, GSB was on the first round of the stimulus uh, program several years ago and got some money for the, car the first phase of the cargo apron. Um, okay. We have not uh, been able to get funding yet for phase two. So that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's where we're, we're working hard to um, get that funded to move forward. But it's also about the buildings. It's, it's not a build it and they will come scenario. It's uh, mm -hmm. you got to have the, the, the customer first or, or understand the, the demand. Um, you know, right now we can, we can push more through our existing facility, but it's working with the freight, uh, the freighters and the carriers trying to time the, the arrival of the flights. Everybody's leaving Europe and they always want to come into the U S late in the afternoon or early evenings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a lot of capacity right now, early in the morning, midday, um, but just due to the timing coming out of Europe, um, that doesn't always work for them. But, uh, um, mm -hmm. but that's that's things we're doing. I, I'll also say that uh, um, back on pressure points, fuel was a pressure point for us. Um, you know, when we took over the FBO, we were GSP was pumping about 12 million gallons of fuel a year. We're now over 20 million gallons of fuel mm -hmm. a year. A lot of that was due to the cargo growth because these wide bodies take 25, sometimes 30,000 gallons at a pop. And they will, mm -hmm. they will put some pressure on the fuel farm. Um, we're, we're going through a project right now to double the size of our fuel farm. Um, mm -hmm. We're investing about uh, probably about $5 million in our fuel farm here. Uh, but um, that, that's another, I'll say, a facility investment that we're having to make as an airport. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, everybody knows what happened just a month ago or less with the Colonial Pipeline. Um, our fuel farm project was in, in the works before that, but uh, we, you know, we need to get that fuel farm expanded. And uh, I guess, uh, yeah, Terry Blue just asked a question, Kevin. So if we can maybe we can just kind of answer that, then we can move on to the developer perspective. Um, oh, Steve, uh, um, oh, they, you know. they are they are airport district employees. Uh, I've got okay. 50, I got right now uh, authorized headcount, uh, uh, 45, 47 FTEs in our cargo division. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, Steve, we'll kind of move to a little bit from the developer perspective. Um, you know, yeah. I, I know kind of same same we talked previously, uh, you know, your projected growth trends for the next three or five years, you know, the graph earlier showed, you know, you know, 20 percent domestically and, and internationally and, you know, worldwide, it's a little bit a little bit less. But, you know, yeah. how, how are you seeing from the development of your facilities, uh, what you're looking at, how you're pursuing? Sure. Uh, the short answer is continued growth, I think, is pretty easy to adopt as, as a posture. Um, I, I think the double digits that we've seen over the last year or so are likely to continue this year, maybe in early next year. Um, to, and we've kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, I, I think long-term it will be well above CPI is that three to 5% per year compounded over the next 10 or 15 years or some other number. Um, but the point is um, we're, we're bullish on continued above CPI mm -hmm. growth for the air cargo business. And once the CV-19 effect and, and once the inventory replenishment effects are behind us, I, you know, you're not gonna see the 10 to 20% year on year growth rates, but I think you're gonna see really strong, I'll call it three to five, uh, largely due to global economic growth, continued e-commerce growth, um, and kind of the fundamental factors that were in place before CV that were supporting strong growth in logistics and air cargo. Okay. Uh, so kind of, yeah, to follow up a little bit from what we were uh, kind of, you know, covering earlier. Uh, so what are you looking at when you're trying to determine for future development areas, what airports, what, what type of facilities, sure. you know, at small, medium slash large hub, you know, how, how does that come into play? Um, yeah, I would say that we're equally interested in gateways mm -hmm. as well as secondary or even tertiary airports. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big distinction, though, in what the opportunities are uh, at, at either case. And to touch on some of the things Kevin said, that I think there's a big fork in the road between freighters and belly capacity. 
Um, in the major kind of gateway cities, you tend to have a mix of both freighters and belly. In other locations, you don't. Um, GSP has done a really nice job of capturing initially the needs of a sole shipper. So for the, the secondary markets or the non-gateway markets that don't have huge belly cargo volumes, uh, we definitely look for a clear demand driver in the form of a shipper, or if it's a airport that's near a major metro area, uh, good demand and good growth for consumer spending that drives e-commerce and other things that require expedited shipping. Um, and the phenomenon there clearly is the e-commerce and other sectors looking for easier airports to get in and out of. Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily cheaper airports to get in and out of, but airports that have uh, easier operating characteristics than some of the gateways. Um, okay. I think that's why you see, particularly in the East Coast, um, airports like Allentown, Richmond, GSP for that matter, although um, the BMW influence there is strong as you know, potential alternatives to Atlanta, to JFK, to Newark, whatever the case may be. Um, you're certainly seeing that in Florida. I mean, uh, Amazon's commitment to Lakeland is a pretty clear example of um, opting for an environment that has a cleaner, clearer operating long-term uh, runway <laughs> to uh, no pun intended versus other alternatives in central Florida that had land that wanted cargo growth and, and didn't get it. So I think all those things matter. Um, uh, freighters versus belly and, and demand drivers are the key. Um, and I know the question was asked and answered, but I think it's really important. Um, Kevin and GSP's perspective on don't build it and they will, will, you know, will come is shared by the developer industry as well. Um, mm -hmm. It will take risks. If there's a hundred thousand foot pre-lease, we may build at 125 or 150,000 mm -hmm. feet, but um, it's not something that lends itself to speculation in our view. Yeah. So yeah, to follow up on what, what you just mentioned with the freighters, I, I believe in the discussion we had last week, you, uh, you and Kevin were discussing that now freighters are starting to operate their own aircraft. Yep. Uh, do you believe that's going to help lead to the freighters to continue to, to, to maintain that position? as the belly cargo comes back or? There's no question that as international belly comes back, the freighter demand for those routes is likely to get back to where it was previously. Um, in terms of domestic traffic, um, you know, I, I think it's kind of steady as, as she goes. Um, in, in terms of expansion and, and versus expansion or redevelopment versus new, um, I think redevelopment at gateways is um, a possibility. They're so land constrained, many gateways are gonna be raising existing facilities to build more modern facilities. Uh, there's a lot of antiquated old 20 to 30 year old air cargo facilities at the major gateway airports throughout the United States that it's basically time to rebuild them. On the secondary markets, again, back to freighters and e-commerce carriers looking for easier, cheaper, in some instances, operating environments, we're going to be building new. So I would say in terms of our business planning, it's a mix probably with building new at secondary airports happening a little bit more frequently than redeveloping or building at gateways just because of the nature of the land availability. And, and kind of following up on that and kind of leading into four and uh, you know, kind of your perspective and, and maybe Kevin's as well as technology or some of the airports with uh, the newer buildings, but how are technology, is that something that's seeing a big benefit for, for where you're, where you're, where you're moving direction of your businesses? Yeah. Uh, technology falls into two major, major buckets as best we can tell in terms of what airports and we certainly support this or are, are trying to do with their cargo facilities um, making them more sustainable through systems that reduce truck queuing, idle times, uh, more efficiency in terms of using the land side doors, more efficiency in using air side uh, aircraft parking capacity. So um, sustainability is a big piece that every airport is now focused on reducing, if not eliminating their cargo footprint and all these things kind of to fold into that. 
And then the other thing is on the revenue side, just making it more clear and more transparent to the users on, you know, where's their cargo coming from? Where's it going? Where is it now? Tracking and, and all of that, I think is, it's not going away. Five or 10 years ago, you could say, well, it's fun to talk about, but nobody's really doing it. People are doing it. All that stuff is in, you know, it's still in development mode, but the adoption is, is not going to reverse. I think it's definitely a trend going forward that's going to accelerate. Are you, are you seeing, as, as Kevin mentioned earlier, with uh, GSP, with some of the issues with CBP, you, as you're seeing that with some of your, the facilities that are going up, or is that usually more handled through the airport itself instead of, instead of your facilities? You know, it's really interesting. The airports more and more are asking the development community to figure some of these things out. So um, historically, we didn't really think about it very much. The CBP, the customs, all that was taken care of. We built buildings, we leased buildings, and that was, mm -hmm. you know, fundamentally our business. It's become much more collaborative and consultative now in terms of uh, do we want um, them in our building? Are we going to provide them free space because it's a benefit to our tenants and it enhances the value? Does the airport want them in our space? So um, the, it, it's definitely become a more complicated proposition for the third party developer than it was before. But we see that as a real opportunity to work with our airport landlords and hopefully make things more efficient for our shared tenants, which whether they're freighters or forwarders or e-commerce companies, um, I, I think there's a virtual circle and kind of breaking down some of those silos that existed in the past. Okay. Just on that uh, customs processing item from airport view, uh, it's so, something we're paying attention to now, though, just because we do not have CDP facilities in our new center cargo facility. Um, mm -hmm. But we have to, um, for all our international flight crews, we have to bus them over to a GA um, clearance facility in the north end of the field. And there's an operational cost uh, of not only obviously have a vehicle to move that crew uh, to customs processing, but also just now I've got to dedicate another person to driving that uh, crew bus you know. or whatever. So there, so I think there's a, there, there, there's potentially an offset setting uh, operational savings uh, when for airports that are building uh, freight, freight facilities to potentially look at, okay, how do you, how are you going to clear crews and yep. whatnot? And it may be worth the investment of, putting, you know, some facility space in, in the freight, freight buildings. Um, the challenge becomes the CDP, uh, planning and design guidelines are very, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're enormous and, and they can drive uh, cost uh, too high on the project. So that's just something we got to figure out between airports and CBP, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we guess John, I guess I think uh, I shot over about five or six minutes here from what I said earlier, but I think we answered some questions during the presentation. So I think we're probably pretty close to on time. Wanted to, so we have roughly 10 minutes left. Just kind of wanted to, uh, to leave this open for people, if you want to ask a question, or I guess, uh, I guess, John, if it's all right, if they can come off mute and ask a question, if they want to do that, I think that'd be fine as well. <clears throat> totally fine. Yep. Yeah. I think I'll scroll through. I think we answered the questions in the chat window as they came in. So if we missed anything, let me know. Does anyone have any other questions or? David, if I can add just one thing, one thing we're hearing Absolutely. from our customers, um, I think us as airport professionals and airport consultants in the business, uh, sometimes we get so focused on the airfield or air side mm -hmm. uh, of cargo and maybe the building. Uh, what needs to be just equally as important as the land side component. Mm -hmm. uh, um, when we talk to carriers and forwarders about using GSP as an alternate gateway, a lot of times it's, 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 it's a lot of times about the speed and it's not just the mm -hmm. speed of unloading the plane or the taxi time. It's the speed to get that truck on the road with cargo. Um, and uh, what we're mm -hmm. hearing um, from, from our customers and hopefully future customers, uh, one thing they, they, they look at is truck uh, movements, uh, truck staging and parking, mm -hmm. and waiting areas for drivers. Uh, a lot of these, I'll say legacy gateways, um, the land side leaves, uh, something to be desired, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. And you've got trucks, truck drivers timing out uh, before they can even get to the uh, freight building. Sometimes they need mm -hmm. parking, waiting areas, maybe remote. And that's, that's another 
potentially uh, potential technology solution there. Mm -hmm. um, I think Steve touched on technology, but I think just just uh, just an advice that uh, airports and airport consultants uh, keep keep in mind the, the, the trucking side. Yeah, I, I would just want to reinforce that point. The, the land side is really the choke point in most instances. It's not the air side. It, it's, it's the land side. Uh, high volumes of trucks. You look at JFK, Miami, LAX, it's an absolute disaster on any given afternoon. Maybe not right now, but mm -hmm. when, you know, significant international belly um, was coming in and out of those airports, there were trucks lined up and down Century Boulevard or throughout Jamaica, pick your location. And um, in these land constrained gateways, technology is really, I think, the only solution is to mm -hmm. tell guys when they're an hour out, you know, be at door 17 in 75 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. Don't just drive up and check in and hope to find an open dock to unload your stuff or to accept your cargo. All that stuff lends itself to being figured out well in advance of the truck showing up at your airport. And single point in, single point out uh, instead of combined operations probably leads to a lot more efficiency there. Have you seen that? It, yeah. Again, it, it's a question of, uh, you know, do you have the land to allow separation? And if you don't, can you get the separation through, you know, technology? And as Kevin said, shark staging systems and offsite and offsite could be 15 miles away or even yeah. farther, right? Um, and, and call people in within five to 10 minutes of when you know the cargo is there, you know the dock is going to be open. Um, I think that's something really to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, Kevin, we had another question come in about your uh, warehouse operation. Uh, um, intrigued about how GSP decided to get into the warehouse operation versus the more traditional land or facility use role. Oh, that's... Uh... Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's probably a little bit longer story than we can cover today, but again, it, uh, you know, and I, I'll say everybody thinks that our cargo is all about BMW. I, I will say BMW was our kind of our launch customer, but today they're probably less than 25, maybe they may be 20 to 25 percent of our cargo volumes now, but uh, we pretty, pretty well diversified uh, what the load is. But uh, going back to when BMW was, they came to the upstate of South Carolina about 25 years ago, the airport runway was lengthened to just over 11,000 feet to handle a lot of air cargo in anticipation for BMW. And when BMW tried to uh, stand up air cargo, unfortunately, they, they couldn't get a carrier because there was no ground handler and they couldn't get a ground handler because there was no carrier. So it was this kind of <laughs> chicken the egg kind of situation. And that went on for years. Um, and, um, you know, occasionally we'd have some charter flights, but a lot of the cargo activity went to other locations in the Southeast and was either trucked uh, to the BMW plant or it was uh, railed. Um, we worked several times trying to get a Ford, uh, to get a carrier or a, a ground handler in here. We just could never get the two things to line up. So the airport uh, uh, invested about a million dollars to start on some ground handling uh, equipment. We, we started as a small on-call operation, just handling emergency charters. Um, mm -hmm. and it kind of grew from there. And, uh, Eventually, we got our first scheduled customer, and it's just it's just kind of over the last, I'll say, five to six years, it's really taken off, and um, you know, it's it's kind of one of those things that took probably ten to twelve years to happen, but it was an overnight success. You know, everybody everybody kind of sees what happened at the last minute, but uh, yeah. um, and and now um, now that we've kind of cut our teeth on it, we've kind of proved we can do it. Uh, uh, at least during COVID, we got a lot more interest um, and. Um, We've, we've actually turned a few customers that have, have uh, historically gone to some of the historical gateways. And when they realize they can uh, fly their uh, freighters in GSB and uh, have probably quicker service, uh, again, that speed of getting the product onto the final mile or uh, mm -hmm. onto the road at, at a, you know, they're getting a high level of service at a competitive price uh, and quicker. Um, uh, we've, we've, we've had some success there and that's, it's just the, uh, it's, it's been an interesting, uh, I, you know, ride. Uh, it's been, been a hard, hard ride, but it's been fun. Uh, but uh, I, I think Rick and Bacher really kind of did this first. Um, you know, this is, we kind of, it's, the, we call it the frop art model. It's, it's pretty common in Europe 
that the airport does a lot of ground handling. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we've got some good friends at uh, Rickenbacker that we talk to a lot, and uh, we've kind of learned a few things from them. But, uh, um, but it's been good. I'd, I'd say the biggest thing is just getting the right people, and we've, uh, uh, we've been lucky to get some good people uh, out of the air cargo industry to uh, come join the GSP team. Okay, cool. Are there uh, uh, any other questions? Kind of, and then I had, had like one last slide, kind of like a lessons learned we can go over real quick. Um, if there are no other questions. Um, okay. I think kind of to kind of leave it at the end, I think these are some recommendations and lessons learned that, that, that came from, from the team there. And uh, I guess most importantly was know your cargo market and know your profile. I think, Kevin, you said that was a very big uh, advantage to y'all, especially dealing with, with uh, as, you, as you explained through the call here today. Yeah, I think um, I we, we tell we tell other airports ask us about this and uh, sp spend some money, spend some time, go study your your area, talk mm -hmm. to your economic development groups, under understand what shippers are in your area, inbound and outbound. It it needs to be a two way uh, process. If you're if you're heavy on the inbound and you don't have the the backhaul, uh, I'll, I'll just say you're going to struggle. Uh, we, you got to have the backhaul. Um, um, Eighty percent of what BMW makes here is exported um, outside the states. So, but you really got to have two-way traffic to make it viable. Um, and, you know, these things, are, they're not going to come in full and leave empty. Um, so you got to help try to develop that backhaul. Um, again, talking to the shippers and forwarders in, area, in your area. Um, um, you know, I think we've talked a lot about the automotive, but, you know, we're moving a lot of um, medical as well and, uh, and other industrial equipment and uh, raw materials. Uh, uh, we're getting into the ag side, and the pharma side as well. So, I mean, it just talk to your state agencies and in your region. I will tell you if the catchment area for cargo is much larger than passenger catchment areas. Um, you know, everybody talks about how far somebody's willing to drive to go catch an airplane, but uh, cargo will drive, uh, I'll say as far as a truck can go in a, in a legal driving day. Um, and, you know, put a, put a couple hundred mile ring around your airport and that's your catchment area for cargo. Um, there's probably cargo if you're not our, if you're not on top of this, there's probably cargo coming to your airport you're not aware of. Just a lot of the just-in-time movements for manufacturing, a lot of it's going to your FBO on small, on-demand uh, uh, cargo. Find out who those people are and who, who's moving product through your FBO. Um, make sure your FBO is supporting that. Um, again, we are, before we got in the FBO business and the ground handling business, our FBO decided to get out of that and neglected that business. So. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and, and as you're, as you're saying, you know, find your champion for moving air uh, as y'all have done there. And, um, you you mentioned understanding the, the hauling back, uh, aspect of it as well. And just, uh, the requirements and need, knowing your inventory, what you need, what your constraints, what your advantages, I think all that would, would help you as you're looking to develop, um, cargo growth in the future at your facility or, or for at another facility that, you know, as a consultant, you might be working with an airport. So I think those are all things to take into account. So. Um, were there any final questions before we wrap up, I guess, or. All right. Well, um, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it to Steve and Kevin to say anything final if they want to, but I just want to say, I really appreciate y'all, uh, joining me and, uh, serving on this, uh, on this webinar. Um, it's, it's been, uh, it's been fun and I really appreciate y'all taking time out of your busy schedule to, uh, uh, to join me, uh, join me for this session. So if y'all want to say something, you go ahead. If not, uh, we can turn it back over to John. No, I would just say happy to do it and enjoy the conversation. Hopefully there was some takeaway value to what Kevin and I shared. So thanks. Absolutely. Likewise, happy to do it. Thank you. I guess John will turn back over to you. Yeah, no, thanks guys. And and David and then Kevin and Steve, thanks a lot. And great conversation. Very interesting and uh, great topic. And um, thanks for it. Thanks for everybody's time on the call. And uh, We'll end it here and uh, get back together next month. So uh, thanks, everybody.